Welcome everyone to pre-shift tidbits of wisdom for everyday service. My name is TJ Griffin and I'm the corporate wine educator for Winebow. We welcome your questions at any point during the webinar, but please use the Q&A rather than the chat bar to submit them. Let me introduce your host. Master sommelier Ron Edwards is the husband of one wife, the father of five girls, a surfer, and a missionary kid. He has over 29 years of hospitality experience and since 2018, he's been the director of wine education for Winebow. And now here to discuss today's topic, the value of technique part two, Master sommelier Ron Edwards. Well, hello, TJ. Hello. It's nice to be together as always. Thanks for joining us for this discussion of the value of technique part two. Yeah, so this is part two. And last time uh, in part one, funny enough, we discussed uh, some of the basic elements of service technique like body posture, uh, left, right, body orientation, using a tray and opening champagne and other sparkling wines. Yeah, so if they're curious about that because they missed that session or they want to share it with a friend, it's on the Weibo YouTube channel under the subcategory of pre-shift. And we had a question come in uh, right after that seminar ended uh, that we didn't have time to get to, but it's, it's a good question. I'd like to ask it now. Okay. Um, how do you feel about the pace of a server or sommelier while walking the dining room? Um, yeah, that's always... A really important thing that um, needs to be trained into people because their pace tends to be normalized to the level of business around them. And that's not the way it should be. The way you deal with your pacing and the way you move through a dining room uh, is that you always have a purposeful um, cadence to your walk. You're never walking slowly, but you're also never walking in a mad rush. So when you have one table, you were moving quickly and crisply through the dining room as if you have 10. And when you have 10 tables, you're still moving the same way as when you had one, because we need the guests to feel like we have a priority and it's them that, that is our priority. And part of that is not, um, allowing a slow moment to dictate us into a, uh, a lazy looking pace, so to speak, and not allowing an overwhelming moment because they happen every Saturday. Everybody in the restaurant industry gets overwhelmed at least for a few minutes every busy night. That can't change your cadence either because it's just part of the discipline of service. Uh, so that's a really good question. I hadn't thought about bringing that up in the lecture. And so I'm really glad that, uh, that Sal asked that question. Yeah, it is a good question. Um, and I wish I had heard that answer before when I was still in service. <laughs> uh, so what are we going to discuss today? Well, how to take over the world, of course, TJ, um, <laughs> for any of the pinky in the brain fans out there like me. Uh, today, we're going to discuss some other technical aspects of uh, service, um, table maintenance. We're going to talk about uh, still wine service, and we're going to talk about decanting. And that's plenty for the time we have allocated. So, you know, um, let's start though, all of the things we're gonna talk about, always throughout this series at least, anytime we're talking about technique or hospitality is really the combination of attitude and technique. Because hospitality begins with the other's centeredness that we bring into the situation, the willingness to express kindness to a guest regardless of the moment in time and regardless of their reaction to the moment in time. The willingness to um, be ready to do what it takes to make our guests happy regardless of what state they come to us. You know, uh, There are times when guests come to us that they are ready to have a good time, they're already enthusiastic, they're easy to entertain. And there are other times that guests come to us that had a bad day, or they had an argument in the car on the way over, or they didn't like waiting for their table, or they're just hangry because it's eight o'clock and they want to eat at six. All of those situations get presented to you in hospitality. They all have to be met with the attitude of kindness and service. And then on top of that, we want to elevate every hospitality experience that we can with, after we have expressed the right attitude, which is applicable to every dining room, regardless of its uh, uh, expense or fanciness or, or casualness or bistroness, um, 
we want to add solid service technique to that because that's what sets the good experience into great experience. That's what takes the great experience to the next level of uh, like, I'm going to remember this the rest of my life is the techniques involved by the people who um, offer their, their full selves into this. And so that's where this comes from. So the first thing we're going to start talking about today is the, the, the really messy, so essential, completely boring, rarely accomplished all that well table maintenance. So TJ, I think this probably can hit home with you. I mean, you've eaten out, you, you, are, you have a family, you go out to eat once in a while. Table man, maintenance is kind of a big deal. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was a big deal when I was in service and, and you know, when, when things are normal, we do like to go out and I have, I have daughters. I don't have a little less than half the number of daughters you have, uh, so <laughs> not as much to, to maintain, but, uh, you know, kids, kids can get messy. Uh, things can get messy. I'm a little bit OCD, so I start to get a little anxious and then my wife starts stacking plates because she worked in the food industry for a long time and she starts, you know, tidying up the table and, it can get out of control pretty quickly. Yeah, and we can, we can circumvent all of those feelings um, with good technique. And, you know, we often think about the flashy things when we think about service technique. We think about, oh, opening a bottle of champagne effortlessly and quietly and, and the oohs and the ahs that come from our guests when we do things like that. But, you know, there is nothing more comforting to your guests as far as what you can do in a technique aspect than keeping their table neat, clean, and orderly. Um, this is such an essential part of a dining room experience because regardless of how you keep your house, you know, some of us are a little messy, some of us are uh, neat freaks, some of us are in between, right? Regardless of how you live, when you go out and you spend your hard-earned money to get a hospitality experience, you expect clean and orderly you expect that you shouldn't have to eat your dinner while your empty salad plate and dirty fork are laying in the center of the table. You expect that you shouldn't have to um, take your glass of water and um, hold it over the outside of the table away from your clothes, you know, just so it won't drip on you. There's some things that you've got to do in table maintenance and, and they, they really boil down to kind of three categories. So you're dealing with debris, you're dealing with plates and glasses, and you're dealing with puddles. So let's deal with, I don't know, what, what order do you want to take them in, TJ? Where do we want to start? Oh, debris sounds uh, a little scary. What, what does that mean, debris? Yes, especially since there's a giant outdoor broom in that. Right? <laughs> uh, no, please don't bring the broom to the table. But debris at a table is what's left behind when the bread gets torn up, what's left behind when things get off people's plates. You know, you're cutting something and it slides off the edge of the plate. There are certainly um, some plateware in restaurants actually is regularly an issue to causing debris. When I worked at one of the restaurants in my past, we had these absolutely gorgeous Bernadeau bowls that we served um, courses in, but there was nowhere that the silverware would fit. It wouldn't lay across the bowl neatly. So people would try to lay it in and then it would fall in and it would slosh stuff out on the tablecloth and things like that. And so some debris is just created by, you know, eating. Some of it is created by the people there that, you know, they're having a good time. They're messing around with stuff. It's the cork on the table. It's the, the crumbs from the bread that they've been tearing off with their hands. It's whatever. All of that changes how you feel about where you're eating. And so we need to pay attention to that. So a server's eyes and a sommelier's eyes and a manager's eyes, when you get to the table, you're looking down to see if they're if they are in a debris free space, there's nothing on the table that it shouldn't be there, which means that there's nothing on the table except the plates and the glasses and the silverware. Um, the ways we, we do that is like, if you work in a, a dining room that actually still uses tablecloths, then there's this thing called a crummer. Uh, I don't know if you ever used one TJ, but they, they come, they work really well. It looks a little bit like a cross between a, 
a cut a cut in half tube and a, a tongue depressor and you can actually get those crumbs just right up on there and dump them into a napkin or onto your uh, side tray over on the side and that is just a that is one of those techniques that someone who knows how to do it right it's really impressive you're not in one of those dining rooms well you know a serviette can do the job for you wiping up the crumbs wiping up the things that are left behind most assuredly if any of the food comes off the plate sauces and things like that they definitely need to be taken care of as soon as possible now we're not doing this in a way that impinges upon uh, the guests space like we're not walking up right in the middle of their bites and starting to crumb and clean the table we're talking about an opportunity is presented when you are taking things away from the table because they're finished with it you also pay attention to the debris, not just the plates and glasses. So let's move into the plates and glasses. Now, this is the easy one, right? Someone finishes with their plate, it's natural that you wanna take it away. Well, it should be natural, but I can tell you I've eaten out a whole lot of times that I've been forced to keep my dirty dishes from the previous appetizer or salad or whatever while my next course comes and nobody seems to care that that's a problem. This picture in the middle is sort of an idea of how you feel, right? Look across that table. Is there any empty space on that table? Most restaurant tables have no spare real estate for anything that isn't being used right now. So please make sure that if they're finished with that wine glass, it goes away. If they're finished with that cocktail, it goes away. In the case of alcoholic beverages or beverages that have to be paid to be refilled, make sure you as a professional inquire. May I take your drink? May I take your glass? May I take your cocktail? Because you never know how long someone's gonna to wanna to hang onto the ice as it melts, and uh, it's a real downer to have to replace a drink for someone who really had finished their drink uh, on the house. Um, silverware. Resilvering is such a big deal in table maintenance. Um, it is such a, a nice, kind, clean, hospitable thing to start your next course with a new knife and a new fork or a spoon that you haven't had before and to get all that other dirty stuff out of the way. Now, I know that's more of a formal dining room thing, but you know, resilvering can be done at every level of restaurant and uh, is a really great practice. Um, and then of course, puddles. Puddles are the scourge of the outdoor dining world, right, TJ? It's like, oh, it's summer. We want to sit outside on the patio and it's great until you pick up your glass and you go to drink out of it and, and the condensation runs off the glass and down your shirt and onto your pants. That's a really great way to aggravate my wife when she's all dressed up is to have the glass drip all over her outfit uh, there in public. So this is something that we can manage. We can manage it by wiping up those condensation puddles that are on the table with our serviettes. We can manage it by using uh, drink coasters, the, you know, the cardboard versions that actually absorb the water, or the, I've seen quite a few that are more like a paper doily. And we can certainly still use the everyday average beverage napkin, right? Um, you know, and sometimes the beverage napkins start to look kind of messy, but it's still better than that glass dripping all over you. I have had to um, move my glass out over the edge of the table, away from my clothing and take a sip, kind of like this over here, uh, too many times to count because um, the restaurant hadn't thought of condensation in the middle of either a very humid summer or even the air conditioning's just not keeping up with um, an open concept kitchen, right? This is really common in your closed dining rooms where the kitchen is viewable from the dining room and there's so much heat and humidity that comes out of a kitchen that your event hood system cannot keep up with that and it starts to get it starts to leak into your dining room and when that happens you'll have condensation problems even in an indoor space so that is the nitty gritty and the not so sexy but very essential world of table maintenance all right so let's talk about one of the more exciting parts of service which is uh uh, still wine service. This, yes, is, this, this is the fun this, stuff. This is definitely the fun stuff because there's there's actually money being added to your check here in an obvious way but since um, servers and sommeliers and restaurants make money off of wine being sold either from the commission of a tip or what or vice versa and in these three pictures if you look real close on your screen you'll see that the picture on the far right is a broken cork. I'm not exactly sure how that one ended up in my media but I'm like yes that happens when you're not paying attention. 
uh, the uh, pouring on the uh, right, and then of course just another version of someone putting a corkscrew in. Uh, so still wine service is, you know, part and parcel for what happens every day in restaurants, uh, either by the glass or by the bottle. So let's talk about opening a bottle of wine at the table. There's only a one difference whether it's white or red, and and that is that whether you need to keep it cold or not. Um, and well, honestly, red wines coming out of a room temperature wine rack in your dining room because you know wine temperature controlled wine storage is not part of your game at that restaurant is too warm so the putting that in a chiller isn't against the rules As a matter of fact i would say nine out of ten restaurants i sit in in the summertime if i order a glass of wine or a bottle of wine i also ask for a glass of ice because nothing against them as individuals they're just not tuned into the fact that that wine would taste better at 60 degrees than it does at 75 or 80, depending on where it was sitting. Um, so what do you need? You need a corkscrew. Uh, the famous waiter's corkscrew is probably the, uh, the standard of the industry. They come in a bunch of different styles. You've got the two steppers that look, people love. Uh, the super prof uh, from, I think it's from Fran Mara is the one that I love so much, but not everybody else does. Um, there's, and there's more and more, right? You don't want to carry around one of those uh, screw down ear thingies like you can use on a counter because you can't do it uh, in your hands. You have to have a corkscrew that can be done completely while holding the bottle. And this is because in classic fine dining service, you would open a bottle of wine, even a bottle of still wine would be opened on a cart or on a side table near the table instead of at the table. But in, in modern restaurant service, that's like almost an impossibility um, internationally, not just here. And so we have to learn how to open wine in our hands. So you need a corkscrew. You need a, a serviette, um, a wine serviette to help with wiping the bottle and for catching drips before you pour. You need a bread and butter plate or a coaster. If you're working at one of those restaurants that has wine coasters, a bread and butter plate will work for the bottle and one for the cork. So that's two. You obviously need glassware for anyone who's going to be trying the wine. And um, there you go. So you definitely want to set the glasses. The glasses come to the table first, then the bottle of wine. Um, there's a lot of logic behind not carrying a bottle of wine on a tray with glasses at the same time, especially because it's so easy to knock the bottle over and then all the glasses go on the floor too. So deliver the glassware, come back with the bottle in your hand ready to present. If it's cold wine and, it, and you have ice buckets on stand, then you would, um, bring the bottle of wine in the ice bucket, set it down, pull it out, dry it, and then present it. In the case of most restaurants today, you probably have, if you're going to serve a chilled wine with something to keep it cold, it's probably one of the chillers, the stone chillers or the um, plastic ones that have basically an insulator. Comes with the bottle. Um, the bottle presentation happens with your serviette folded neatly behind the bottle with the label towards the guest. You're standing on their right side, presenting the wine from the right side, as we learned in our last uh, presentation. You're going to read the label to them as best you can. This is the Chateau Fleur Fleur 1989, absolutely fabulous bottle. Um, whatever the wine is, do your best. This is where learning to pronounce the wines on your wine list within the best of your ability with confidence comes in as being a professional. I don't speak any more languages than English. I barely speak a little Spanish, but I speak a lot of labels because that's part of my job. And when I have someone who I can access to help me learn to speak that label better, I definitely do that. So then the last thing, most restaurant wine lists especially have bin numbers. And those bin numbers are your best friend because if your pronunciation doesn't match up to the guest pronunciation, the bin number will, bin 153. Is this correct? Yes, that's correct. This is now, you've just made a contract with them that yes, this is the wine I ordered. Yes, this is the wine I wanted you to bring. Yes, please open it for me. It's when we don't have that contract verbally that we get into trouble where somebody looks down and goes, no, that's not the vintage I ordered. Or no, no, I wanted the Cabernet, not the Merlot. Or, and the list goes on. So make sure you go through the entire thing. Producer, vintage, grape type if it's listed, subregion of the world if it's listed, and the bin number. That makes, makes sure everybody comfortable. From there, we are moving. Remember, if you saw the last one, the serviette goes on my fingers here, and then I hold the bottle. 
uh, you're moving the bottle to your non-opening hand. If you're right-handed like I am, you're holding the bottle in your left hand up around the neck. We are not putting the bottle on the table in um, our normal restaurant service. If you have this marvelous luxury of a wine opening station near the table where they can see you, because they want it, it's a contract, right? They want to, you want to be absolutely clear with them that I'm still opening your wine, nothing's happening to it, it's not leaving your site, then certainly you could go back to that side station. Uh, we had that, and when I worked at Tapawingo, we had a side station for wine um, where we could decant, where we could do a lot of things. The, in a super formal dining room where you can roll a cart out, you could you roll out your cart, you open your wine on your cart, and then you take it back. In a less formal environment where you might want to not be so close to the table opening the wine, bring out a tray and a tray jack with linen on it so that it looks like a workspace and open the wine on that. Absent of all of those, you're opening the wine in your hand in the air because it's really just not good to have that bottle of wine on the table. There's too many bad things that can happen on the corner of the table. What is on the corner of the table to the host right is the B&B &B plate to set the bottle on once it's open and the B&B &B plate to set the cork on once you've extracted it. So we are going to cut at the bottom of the second lip. There are two lips on a bottle of wine. The, the one at the top is the wrong one to cut because that will cause the wine to drip even more. So go to the next la layer, like you can see in the picture on the right, you can see that they did indeed cut the foil at the correct place. Cut it underneath, go, go around, flip your hand over, go back around. And then the most important cut is the one from vertically, from the, the circular cut you placed, cut up in an opposite direction to the center of the cork, and that'll release the tension, which is especially bad on either the plastic capsules or the aluminum ones. They can be really tight and uh, hard to peel off. And it's not uncommon to be peeling the, the uh, capsule off and cut the edge of your finger. So if, if you cut up the center, it, it helps a lot with that. You're going to take the corkscrew and you're going to put it in your hand and the, the um, auger line up with your index finger and then you use your index finger to locate the corkscrew into the center of the cork, push and twist at the same time. And if you do it right, push, twist, the corkscrew will stand there on its own at that point. And then you can rearrange your hand and, and drive it the rest of the way. You want to use as much of the auger as possible because when you have part of the auger in instead of all of the auger in, you end up with the bottle on the right in this picture where you've broken a cork because you did not give enough strength to the entire interior of the cork. Use the so, lever, extract the, extract the cork. Yes, yes, TJ. So what do you do when, when in that situation where you have that, uh, has that happened to you during service where the cork breaks? Oh, of course, yeah. Sometimes it's your fault. Sometimes it's just a weak cork, especially if you're fortunate to work in a restaurant that has a depth of vintages. Um, it's, first of all, it is not an immediate cause to replace the bottle for the guest. Um, this is when you uh, use your corkscrew to try and grab the rest of the cork very gently and extract it. Uh, one of the other things you can use to help get wine out with a broken cork is an osso, the one that's just the two prongs, and those are good to have around a restaurant for emergencies. And the last but certainly not least is the, um, uh, have you, there, I think they're just called screw pulls, and they're basically a variation of the theme of the old arm one, except you drill it down and it has an auger that's literally about that long, so you can make sure it gets through the entire cork, and then, and then basically it slowly uh, pulls the cork up onto the corkscrew instead of you pulling it forcefully. It's a very slow process and a lot of times that will extract the cork cleanly. If it's not extracted cleanly and there's bits of cork that fall into the bottle, that also is not a reason to get rid of the wine. We'll cover that in decanting. Uh, in general, a broken cork is not an indication that the wine itself is bad. It was either bad technique or the wine's old and we still need to taste it to find out. All right, so we've extracted the cork. We've presented the cork onto the plate. If the cork had crumbled or was broken in a bunch of different pieces, there would be no need to present it on the plate. That's just a mess. It's not helping anybody. Just set it in your pocket, put it on the side table, wherever you are, and take the bottle out. Wipe the lip. 
and just inside with the serviette, don't touch that area with your hands because you've already, um, that's where they're going to have their wine come out of. Uh, I did forget to mention before you take the cork out, take the um, capsule off, wipe the bottle at that point, especially if it's an older bottle from the cellar, it'll often have stuff under the capsule. Pour the host an ounce and a half to taste and then proceed from there with normal service, which would be uh, to the host's left. Um, traditional service is ladies first and gentlemen second. Um, and then come back to the host last. Just don't forget the host. And that's how still wine service works. TJ, did I go so fast that I was a blur or did it make sense? No, it totally made sense. It's, uh, it's, it's a hard thing to explain. It's a lot easier to show. But uh, in, this, uh, in this instance, you did a great job describing. But I, I have a question, though, mm -hmm. about something I know you're a big fan of, which is alternative closures like vino locks, uh, stealth enclosures, aka screw caps. Those are really common now. So, they are common, and I wish they were more common um, because in re I, I have a, um, I'm, I shouldn't go there. I prefer those as a guarantee that the quality of the wine that the winemaker made is the same when I get it, and I don't have to worry about whether that cork had a problem with trichloroanisole. And um, anyway, there's nothing wrong with pre presenting these bottles. You shouldn't feel cheated as the server or the sommelier that you can't use your corkscrew. You should be grateful. In the Eno lock, it's just a pop of the thumb, or you can use the blade of your knife to release the, um, the um, vacuum on it, and then it comes out. Now, the Eno lock, which is a little glass stopper, you can present that on the table, and um, it'll often be a conversation starter where you can say, yes, this is one of our new alternative closers. I love it. I think it's great, and it's pretty. And then, but with a Stelv enclosure, the twist-off capsule, that does not go to the table because it's sharp and it's dangerous. So that one you keep nearby. Um, I recommend that near your service areas, there's an, uh, a bucket uh, a, where corks for the night and screw cap capsules for the night, once they, when they leave the table, they go there. And the reason for that is that some people like to collect corks. And even if they, at the end of the night, nobody wanted what you put over there instead of throwing away, someone will come in and go, hey, I'm building a cork board. Can I have the corks? And you'll make their night by giving them your bag of corks. Uh, and the other is that because the stealth enclosure is dangerous, it's better to keep it there than in your pocket. And if you're working in a state where people can take wine home with them because it's not finished, you won't have to go looking for a way to seal that bottle up. Uh-oh. Yeah. The picture. When I was <laughs> when I was prepping for my certified sommelier exam, one of the things that made me nervous, and I suspect made a lot of other folks that I was studying with nervous, was the prospect of having to decant. Did decanting make you nervous when you were in service? Um, it did until I did it hundreds of times as a practice. So that's really the answer. But the reason that I was able to do it hundreds of times is I took a posture in my dining room that decanting every wine was a good thing. Uh, and so I started doing it for several reasons. So let's start with, before we start about how to decant, let's talk about why should you decant. The first and most important reason to decant is to separate sediment from an older wine. So the sediment stays in the bottle and you're decanting it into your carafe. In most restaurants, this isn't a reality because we're not, we don't have cellars where we're holding old wines, etc. And so what's the second reason? The second reason is aeration to help wake a wine up and a decanter, the shape of the one in this gentleman's hand is very much about aeration, increasing the uh, surface area where oxygen can get in and interact with the wine and create the, the a greater proliferation of uh, aroma compounds so that the wine is more enjoyable. Um, another one is temperature. If you are blessed to have temperature controlled storage in your dining room, red wine to an American palate coming out at 58 degrees and immediately going in a glass is too cold. It's going to get that like, wow, this is tartar than I thought, or this doesn't have as much flavor as I remember, and it's just not going to go well. So decanting to warm it up into the mid 60s is a great plan. And, and there's a little trick for that. And that is to um, either warm the decant, keep the decanters warm, meaning like definitely room temperature. And then the other is I would often make sure that I always poured the wine over top of where my hand was on the glass, just helping every little bit of, of temperature go across. 
The inverse of that is I sold the last cold bottle of XYZ white wine and I need to serve it right now to a table. So I would take my um, decanter and I'd put it in an ice bucket, submerge it, get the glass good and cold, and then use the principles of refrigeration to pour the white wine over the cold glass and chill it quickly. It works really, really well. And then the, and it aerates the white wine too. White wine and red wine can be decanted. I actually think most young white burgundy should be decanted before you drink it. Otherwise, by the time it's almost gone, it's just now waking up in, in most cases. Um, decanting is also a privilege of the guest, meaning they can request it or they can request that you not do it. I know some people who just refuse to decant Pinot Noir because they feel like there's a poof of magic that's missed when you decant it. I used to feel that way. I don't feel that way anymore. And so now, when should you decant? Uh, if you want to sell a little bit more wine in your restaurant, get about 12 decanters. Um, there's a, there are, you know, like Luminarch makes one that I think is about $3 wholesale. It's my favorite decanter. And start decanting everything. Just decant everything that's ordered in your dining room. Um, and pretty soon people will be paying attention to the fact that, oh, look at that extra service they got over there. How do I get that? Oh, I must have to order a bottle of wine and boom, you just sell more wines by the bottle automatically. So what's needed? You need a craft and then you need all the things that you had previously for opening still wine with the added possibility of a light source, which in the good old days was a candle and something to light it. In these days, it could be a, a, a light, um, Basically, one of those flat um, flashlights would be ideal in modern dining room because it points directly up. There's no danger of setting anybody on fire, but you need a light source. You still need your serviettes, probably two at this time, one for the bottle, one for the decanter. And now you need one more B&B plate, one for the decanter, one for the cork, one for the bottle. And you're going to wander over to the table. In classic decanting service, all of this comes on the decanting cart. And you get to open the wine and you say, 1985 Margot, sir. Uh, that is not most people's reality. But if you do have that luxury, what a luxury, because all of your stuff is in one place and it's off the maintenance of the table and you get your own little show going on. It's very cool. If you'd like to mimic that in a normal dining room, use a tray and a tray jack. It's so much better than trying to decant on the corner of the table. Bring the tray jack out with all of your supplies, your decanter, your wine, your serviettes, your B&Bs. Uh, and your corkscrew laying on the tray. Set it up near the table, present the wine as you would normally, and then go back to your tray jack and do the decanting process. That is how I practiced for all my exams because I never worked in a dining room that actually had a decanting cart. The last option and most common is to decant at a side station away from the table, but where they can see that you are manipulating only their wine and what's in the, in the carafe when it comes back is their wine. If you cannot open it on a side station where they can see the authenticity of what you're doing, then it is time to do it at the side, right at the table. So you set the tray, you set the uh, carafe down on one B&B, you open the bottle, you shift your serviettes around and wipe the bottle, et cetera, just like we mentioned before. Then you pick up the carafe with your non-pouring hand, like this gentleman has, and you pour it beside the table over your light source, which is probably sitting right on the corner. Now, if you are decanting with a candle, you cannot do that on the table because that's putting an open flame next to the guest. If you have one of these magic little light sources, that's great. Do not use your phone. I mean, it's super easy to use, but your phone is a very personal item and it doesn't feel clean to other people. So it shouldn't be on their table because uh, it's probably coming out of your pocket and coming out of your pocket onto their table. I mean, that just immediately sounds gross, right, TJ? So those are the processes. It's not magic. It's not really mysterious, it, but it is a process. Opening the wine is the same as still wine. And then you're picking up this glass container and transferring the wine over. You're pouring it in a sediment situation. You're pouring it slowly about the rate that you see this gentleman pouring here so that you can catch the sediment in the neck with your light source. You can see it getting cloudy and you stop pouring. Now, if it's a sediment based decanting, that means you brought it to the table in a decanting cradle or basket of some sort. Because if you just pull it off of the wine shelf, stand it up and bring it to the table and it actually has sediment in it, you've ruined it. it you, it's no point. I was at a restaurant um, that I dearly love that has a really deep cellar 
And it, it took me about nine years before I finally convinced them, please use baskets because somebody else had trained them how to do it by bringing the bottle up horizontal, laying it on a tray, pinning it so it can't roll, taking it out to the dining room, et cetera. And I had ordered a 1978 um, Rubicon. And um, it was, I was hoping it wasn't their last bottle because when he walked into the dining room, he stood it up and then laid it back down and then it rolled on the tray. And I was, I just called the manager and said, we cannot open that bottle. Do you have another one? That one's rolled around and needs to, it needs to rest another month. So that's the purpose of the decanting basket. You can find them online if you'd like some for your restaurant or your, or your hotel. And they're not very expensive and you don't need a lot of them. Depends on how many old wines you have. I've never had a restaurant where I had more than two. And that's decanting. What did I leave out, TJ? I think you covered it. Well, that's amazing. Let's open some champagne. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Is it five o'clock yet? I'm yes, sure it's five o'clock somewhere. Is it five o'clock in Bermuda? They're, they're celebrating that Teddy went the other way. Yes, but uh, the Newfoundlanders, how do you say that? People who live in Newfoundland. Yes, those, that, that's how I would say it. <laughs> they're a little worried right now. That's, that's one yes. big, big storm. So a couple of quick questions. Uh, one, going back to table maintenance. Mm -hmm. um, this is a tough one because I've heard it both ways. Do you wait until everyone's finished to start clearing plates or clear as people finish up? Uh, classic service is you wait until everyone's finished because um, otherwise they're the one slow eater then suddenly is pointed out to the entire group that you're a really slow eater. Um, there's a variation on this theme in the United States that basically says if my guest looks very uncomfortable with the dirty plates in front of them, then I would take them their plates to keep that person comfortable. I would, however, not clear to the point that only one person has plates left. So if it was a four top and one person was like shoving their plates around and obviously like, I got to get rid of this, I would go ahead and clear that in honor of their wishes. But I wouldn't go so far as to leave only one person of the four with plates still on the table while eating. And I would, I would almost never clear a, a party of two until they are both finished. Uh, it, again, if there's a, an obvious sign that this just can't go on any longer, I'm unhappy, then I might clear and actually ask if it's okay with you, I'll clear their plates and the other person usually agrees and then they're, they're sort of sold on it. Um, that's a good question. But um, we, we want people to feel like they've finished at the same time. So we have another question here. What wines, uh, 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 which, Wines of certain age and type, do you like to decant? That's a good question. And then um, while we're at, I'm going to answer that. And then uh, Dina has her hand up and I'm not sure why. So let's, uh, whatever you may need, Dina, pot, put it in the Q&A um, because uh, I'm not sure what you need. Um, okay, so age and what type of wines do you like to decant? I, I, I was being quite transparent about the idea that I kind of moved into a world of I decant everything in restaurants. I don't decant much at home because I'm willing to sit around at home and let the wine wake up. But in a restaurant environment, we're all working in a fairly fast paced clip. If you think about formal dining spaces, right? Formal dining spaces in America, a two hour dinner is a pretty long time, right? that's not that long to open a young wine. So I believe in having a large number of decanters, depending on the number of seats in your restaurant, positioned where people can use them, rinse them, uh, turn them upside down and get ready for the next bottle. And then teach your staff a uh, prepping routine of using something from the, the BTG program, the bioglass program that they put an ounce in there to make sure there's no water and then they dump it out in front of the guest. It, I actually went through the process of I bring the wine in a little carafe, pour it, it tell the guest I'm, I'm prepping your decanter, pour the good wine in to make sure there is no water left, pour it out and then start decanting. It sounds like a lot but it's really just one small extra step and it adds to the show unbelievably. Um, but especially um, Young, rich red wines, even if you decide not to decant everything, decanting young, rich red wines, Cabernet Sauvignon-based wines, Bordeaux-based wines, Rioja, you know, Barolo, Barbaresco, definitely want to decant those. 
all of that stuff from Tuscany, all of it, all of it will work better if you decant it and uh, let it aerate. Um, you'll also, I promise you, you'll end up selling more wine in your hospitality environment because people love the show and they want that experience at their table too. Did I, did I answer that fully enough for David? I think so. Yeah. Um, so you, you weren't being facetious earlier when you said, no, <laughs> no. Um, the last restaurant I consulted for, we had, uh, it sat, I think it sat 49 people inside and 35, uh, 40 people outside in the summertime. And we had 12 decanters. So last question, cause it's getting a little late, but, um, this is an important one. I have seen this. I've never worked in a, in a wine program that did this, but there are some wine programs where the sommelier will actually taste the wine before you do to assess it, to make sure it's, it's yeah. sound and everything. How do you feel about that? Is that something you uh, recommend? Okay. So that is a house policy that I will not tell somebody that they have an incorrect house policy, but this is how I feel about it. Okay. So please separate my own personal feelings from formal service routine because there are, you know, like Charlie Trotters, you tasted everything before you send it to the table. And there's still a big tradition in Europe where the sommelier tastes the bottle to check that it's sound in the United States where people are already afraid of wine and afraid to try something new because they might waste their money and not like it. You know what I mean? To have the sommelier taste it and tell you it's good takes the control out of the guest's hands to disagree that it's good. And I'm unwilling to take that risk in my dining rooms. Now, my compromise to that is I have a very sensitive olfactory to trichloranosol. And so it is rare that a corked bottle would be opened anywhere near my face and I would miss that it was off. Uh, that was the other reason I decanted so often is because while I was decanting it, I could clearly smell the wine. And if it was corked, I didn't ever let it hit the table. I would just tell the guest, um, this wine is flawed. I'm going to get a different bottle and just walk away with it. Um, and if they came back and said, well, will this bottle be fine? And then I would, while opening, explain why I took the other bottle away. Um, you know, so some restaurants get away with it. Um, it's, it's definitely not a policy that I ever embraced, nor um, like the other problem with it is you get drunk sommeliers uh, through the course of the evening. If you tasted every wine I opened on the floor at Tapawingo, I'm not sure I would have been able to walk by the end of the night because I was opening wine nonstop for four or five hours. That's, that's an unexpected side benefit of decanting as well. I never thought of that. You could, you could detect a flawed wine before the, the guest gets it. Yeah. Yeah, especially if you're used to serving that wine, you can, you can, you know what it's supposed to smell like before it hits the carafe. So. All right. So coming up in two weeks on October 6th, same time, 3 PM Eastern, our next topic is building a wine program. And I, I see the Roman numeral one, which means it's going to be a, a multi-part, topic. Yeah, there's no way I can cover that in even in three hours. I probably can't cover it justice and do justice to it. But I'm going to lay down some principles next week that you think about before you even get started. And then from there, we'll, we'll uh, go through some of the decision making process that follows. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, hopefully we see you in two weeks on October 6th. Until then, stay safe. Be well. Bye, Ron. Thank you. Bye, TJ. Bye, everybody.